Welcome to Excel 2013 Statistical Analysis video number 44. Hey, if you want to download this Excel workbook or the PDF files, click on the link below the video. Hey, last video, we calculated x bar of 255. And then we saw that there was, for this particular sample, a sampling error of minus 34. Then we went over and we actually listed every single possible sample and calculated the x bar for every single possible sample. We saw that that particular sample we selected was right here. Now in this video, we want to talk about what happens when we plot every single possible x bar to create what's called the sampling distribution of x bar. What we're going to try and create is the sampling distribution of x bar. Sometimes I'll abbreviate it sample distribution of x bar. It is just the probability distribution of all possible values of sample mean x bar. Remember, we have the entire list of x bars, so we can plot them and look at the distribution. Remember, this is our normal curve. If we plot a histogram and it looks bell-shaped, then we're allowed to use the normal distributions. Now, x bar is our random variable. And we're going to have a mean and a standard deviation for this sample and distribution of x bar. We're going to discover something surprising that when we actually take the mean of all the means, it'll be called the expected value of x bar. It's actually going to be exactly equal to the population mean. Then we'll also discover when we plot the sampling distribution of x bar that the variation is less. And so standard deviation sub x bar, or the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar, will have to be adjusted by dividing by the square root of n to bring it down a bit. Now, the amazing thing about all this is once we establish that we can use the normal curve, we can now take a sample and compare it directly to this sample and distribution of x bar and see if our sample is reasonable or not. Now let's go over and try this. Now you remember from last video, this was the population data. And we actually listed every sample. Then we did VLOOKUP to get every single number associated with the three elements in each sample. Then we calculated the mean. All we want to do here in this video is plot and then calculate the mean of every single one of our means. In fact, we're going to do that one first. Let's just come over here, and let's first calculate population mean. So equals average. And there it is, and Enter. Now, last video, we actually calculated the population mean and compared it to individual means. And of course, there was sampling error every single time. We didn't have a situation where the actual population mean was equal to exactly one of the sample means. But now we're going to do something totally different. We're going to calculate the mean of all the means. So if we have a bunch of x bars, yes, each one is a mean. But if we have every single one, are we allowed to calculate the mean of all of those? You betcha. So you could call it the mean of all the means. It's also called the expected value of x bar. It can be written like this, expected value of x bar. Even this one, mu sub x bar. So let's get the big drum roll out and calculate the mean of all the means. Control Shift down arrow, Shift Enter. And lo and behold, it's exactly the same as the population mean. And that will happen every single time. Every time you list every sample and calculate the mean for every one of the samples, and then take the mean of all the means, the expected value for x bar, it will always equal the population mean. So conclusion number one. Mu equals expected value for x bar. Now what does that mean? That means any time we're given the population mean, we can use it as our mean for the sampling distribution of x bar. So if we have a filling machine example, and it says 20 ounces on the ketchup bottle, we simply take that as our mean, go out and test our sample, and compare it against that population mean. 
Now, that's conclusion number one. Let's go plot all of these numbers. So we're going to do just what we did ever since chapter two, when we learned about histograms. Here's some categories. We're going to plot the population data, look at it on the histogram. Then we're going to plot all of the x bars. So first, we're going to do a count ifs for the population data over here. And we're going to compare each one of those items to a lower and upper. Here's our categories that will be on the horizontal axis. This will be our frequency or our count. So I'm going to use count ifs. The criteria range, I'm going to scroll over and get the population data. F4 to lock it. Comma. Now the criteria I need to say greater than or equal to the lower. So in double quotes, greater than or equal to, in double quotes, and join it with the ampersand to the lower. That's a relative cell reference. Comma, now I'm going to need that same range again. I'm going to do a little trick here. I'm going to click on my criteria range. Argument, Control C to copy. Then click on my criteria range tool and Control V to paste. I just didn't want to scroll over there. Comma, the criteria two. This is going to be in double quotes less than in double quotes and join it with the ampersand to the upper. So for this particular setup, we're going to not include the upper and include the lower. So notice the equal sign is only there, not on the upper. And that'll do it. Control Enter. Double click and send it down. So we could go ahead and plot this. And why don't we do that? I'm going to highlight the categories for the horizontal and the actual frequencies. Insert column. First one there. Click on the horizontal lines. Whoops, not the outside edge, the inside lines. Delete. Click on this axis, delete. Click on the columns, Control-1 to open up our task pane. Change the gap width to 0. I'm going to go over to the bucket, say Borders, Solid Line, and change it to black. Close. I'm going to come over to the plus and list the axis titles. This one's already highlighted. Equal sign shoots me up to the formula bar. I click on Frequency and Enter. I'm going to click on the horizontal axis. Equal sign shoots me up to the formula bar, and I'm going to scroll over. It says sales equals x, because these are x. All right, so I can see the formula up there and enter. Go back to my plus, and I'm going to say show data labels. So there it is. That looks pretty uniform, right? That's definitely not normally distributed. So here's the population data. Now let's do the same thing for the actual x bars. For the frequency, we're going to calculate for all of the sample means. So you ready? Equals, same formula, count ifs. But we're going to have a different range. All of the means, Control Shift down arrow, F4, comma, in double quotes, greater than or equal to in double quotes, ampersand. And let's get our lower and do the same trick here. Click on Criteria Range 2, Copy. Click on Criteria Range. Actually, it won't work. I have to type a comma and then Control-V. Comma, and then in double quotes, less than in double quotes, and join it to the upper. Close parentheses, Control-Enter, double click, and send it down. Wow, look at that. Already we can see, without even doing our chart, just the frequency distribution says that looks bell-shaped. There's a 10 in the middle, a 7, a 7, a 4, a 4, a 1, and a 2. That is amazing. Now I'm going to highlight the category column and then hold Control and select the column with our frequencies for the sampling and distribution of x bar. Insert column. Click on the inside grid lines, delete. I'm going to delete the axis. Click on the columns, Control-1. Change the gap width. Bucket, I'm going to go down to Border and Solid Line. Close the Task Pane. I want to add Access Titles, Equal Sign, and Frequency. Enter. Click on the Access. Equal Sign shoots me up here. And now I want my label in I5 and Enter. This is the sample mean x bar. Random variable x, that is incorrect. I'm going to come over here and change this to x bar. That's what I've been talking about. x bar is the random variable. There's our proper axis label. Come over to the plus. Data labels. 
And look at that. So our second conclusion, and actually we're going to do this on a bigger data set and just to see that it's true. But this is the case if you plot all of the x bars, every single one of them, it tends to be a normally distributed shape. Not only that, but the bigger the n, the more it tends to be normal. And we'll see the central limit theorem will state that explicitly. We even have a small data set here, right? But it sure looks like normal to us. And our rule earlier in the class is if the distribution looks like it's bell-shaped, then we're allowed to use that model. So that means we can actually just go out and take a sample. As long as we know the population mean, we can just compare that sample using our normal curve. And we'll see how to do that coming up. So I want to put these side by side and then talk about our second conclusion. So there's the population distribution. Here is the sampling distribution of x bar. So conclusion number two, sampling distribution of sample means tends to be normally distributed. Oh, and there's less spread in the data. Now this is a pretty small data set, so it's not as dramatic. But look, we are going from the population data, looks like down to about 175 to 425. But over here, it's from 200 up to 375. So there's less spread when we do our sampling distribution of x bar. And that better makes sense, because think of this. What is this? These are all the averages or the means. So it's certainly a central tendency number. So when we plot all of these numbers that tend to be central, the spread in the data is going to be much smaller. Now let's expand on this conclusion number two, because this will lead up the central limit theorem. If all samples of a particular size are selected from any population, the sampling distribution of the sample mean, or x bar, is approximately a normal distribution. This approximation approves with larger samples. So the central limit theorem is stated here. In selecting random samples of size n from a population, the sampling distribution of x bar can be approximated by the normal distribution as the sample size becomes larger. And here's our rule here. If the original population distribution is symmetrical but not normal, the distribution will converge towards normal when n is greater than 10. So that means we just have to have a sample of greater than 10. Skewed or thick tail distribution converges towards normal when n is greater than 30. Even a heavily skewed distribution will converge n greater than 50. Now I want to go look at a picture that's from our textbook, but I have it in our PDF. So let's go over to our PDF. And there it is. Here's like a diagram for each one of these original distributions. Uniform, exponential. This looks like a skateboard ramp, right? Here's a skateboard ramp, too. But these distributions are not normally distributed. But look what happens when we have n equals to 2, n equals to 6, n equals to 30. These are definitely tending to look normally distributed. Also look that the variation is, l is less for each one of these compared to our original distributions. That is profound. So the use of the central limit theorem, that means we can reason about the sampling distribution of x bar. That means our normal curve with absolutely no information about the shape of the original distribution from which the sample is taken, as long as we have n big enough, right? This means that we can take one sample and compare it to the standard normal curve. That would be our norm.s.dist or the normal curve norm.dist to see if our sample result is reasonable or not. If it is reasonable, the process or claim will be considered reasonable. If it's not reasonable, meaning it's, it's probabilistically too far out, the process or claim will not be reasonable. Now, before we use the central limit theorem, we actually want to go create one more sampling distribution of x bar. So I'm going to scroll over and on the sheet, sampling distribution of x bar 2. Here's our expanded sales reps, and here's the sales. Now, I want to come over to the sheet combinations. And look, we have 17 population items, and our sample size is 5. If we figure out the number of combinations, that's all the possible samples. Boom, 6,188. That is way too many to list by hand. 
So I went out to the internet, and at MrExcel.com, I found some code. And at this uh, website, it told me how to install this button here. So watch this. The code underneath says, hey, you have your names from A2 and below. We can put any number of names here. And then in cell C2 is the number of samples. The code will actually count and figure out N. It'll then list starting in E2 all the way over to I2 and all the way down every single combination. All right, so you ready? I'm going to click this button. Boop. And just like that, it lists control down arrow. Oh my heavens, exactly every single combinations. Now I'm going to click in one cell, control asterisk on the number pad to highlight, control C to copy. And then I'm going to come over here. And I'm not going to paste because I don't want to replace the borders. I'm going to go up to Home, Paste Special. And right here it says Values. And just like that. Now, just as we did last video, we're going to look up every single number associated with every single item in each sample. So we're going to use the VLOOKUP function equals VLOOKUP. I'm going to look up Ashley, and that's a relative cell reference. So as I copy this over and down, that blue cell reference will move and always be looking up the right person, comma, the table. First column has all of the names we're looking up. Subsequent columns have items we want to retrieve and bring back to the cell. I need to hit F4 to lock it, comma. Column 1, column 2 has the numbers we want to retrieve. So the column index number is 2, comma. And we're doing exact match. So you put false or 0. Control Enter and copy it over to the mislabeled five columns. This is going to be Sales 1. And I'll copy this over here. Now I can highlight these numbers. Double click and send it down. Control down arrow, because I'm going to go and check the very last one, F2. And sure enough, look at that. So for Tyrone, it got 1,893. Control home. And sure enough, exactly correct. VLOOKUP came to our rescue there. Now we can calculate X bar for every single possible sample we have. So average. And we'll do the relative cell references 5 to the left. Control Enter, double click, and send it down. So that's a list right there. That's every single possible sample that we can get from this population data. Now let's go ahead and plot it. We're going to plot the population first, and then our X bar data equals count ifs. Go over and get the population data, F4 to lock it comma, and then in double quotes, greater than or equal to in double quotes, and the ampersand, whoop, that's the lower. That's the criteria for the lower, comma. Let me do that same trick. Click on criteria range 1, Control C. Click on criteria range 2, Control V, comma. And then the second comparative operator, hey, that's got to also be less than, in double quotes, join it to the upper. Close parentheses, Control Enter, double click, and send it down. Now watch this. I'm going to totally cheat. I'm going to copy this in edit mode, because I don't want to retype all those ampersands and everything, and paste it right here. The only thing I need to change is, oh, criteria range 1, I just highlight it. I don't even have to delete. I just click in the top cell, Control Shift Down Arrow F4. Now I can click criteria range 1, Control C. Click on criteria range 2, and Control V. Cheap little tricks there to build the formula faster. Control Enter. Double click and send it down. Now we can see from the population data, it's all over the map. Here we clearly see it's looking like a bell shaped symmetrical distribution. It's not totally perfect, right? But it's pretty darn close, close enough that it, it allows us to use the model. Now I'm going to make a histogram, highlight, insert, columns. Click on the actual columns, Control 1, change the gap width. Come over to the plus. I'm going to put a data label at the top, and then I'm going to click Access Titles. Close this. The vertical one is selected. Equals shoots me up to the formula bar and frequency. Click on the horizontal axis equal sign, and I'm going to scroll over and click on Sales X and Enter. You know, I'm going to click on the columns. Control One, Paint Bucket. Border, solid line. All right, now let's do our second 
data set. So there's one. We'll do our labels. And holding control, I now click the frequencies for our X bars. Insert, column. Click on the column control one, change the gap width. Bucket, I'm going to do so border solid line. Click on the plus, check axis titles and data labels. The axis title equal sign shoots me up there. Click on frequency and enter. Equal sign shoots me up there. I'm going to click on the label and enter. Close the task pane. And there, so our conclusion number two that we saw in our first example, it looks like the population distribution is definitely not normally distributed or bell shaped or symmetrical at all. But when we plot all of the x bar, it tends to be normally distributed. That means X bars. It's OK for us to go out and take a sample and then use that normal curve. Remember the norm.s.dist or norm.dis and compare and get a probability number that tells us whether our sample mean is reasonable or not. Now we got to check one last thing, and actually the more amazing thing here the population mean equals average. And I'm going to highlight. Enter. So it looks like 64,706 bucks. And here's the mean of all the means. And I want to change this to expected value of x bar. That is the mean of all the means. We could also show it as our symbol mu sub x bar. So here we go. And we just use average, and we get every single possible x bar. Control Shift Down Arrow, Shift Enter to put it in the cell and pop it up. And no way, they're exactly the same. That is pretty amazing. Every single x bar, plot them. And we see Bell. Every single x bar, we calculate the average, and it's exactly equal to the original population mean. Now there's a third characteristic of this sampling distribution of x bar we want to notice. And we talked about this in our first example. Notice the range here, or the variation, goes from 10,000 to 120,000. But in our sampling distribution of x bar, the range or the variation is less. So it goes from about 20 to 110k. And what that means is if we know that the expected x bar of this is equal to the population mean. Well, that's the mean, but we need a standard deviation. So I actually want to go over to our PDFs and look at the PDFs and then come back and calculate our standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar. Now, there's going to be a difference between an infinite population and a finite population. For the infinite population, we take sigma, standard deviation of the population, and divide by the square root of n. For a finite population, we're going to have what's called a correction factor. Now, this correction factor does not have to be used all the time. It just has to be used when the sample size divided by population size is less than or equal to 0.05. And most of the time, we're not going to have to use this because n will be big enough. The textbook assumes on every problem except for when they have one or two problems where you have to try this. And we'll actually look at this uh, later in this video. But the textbook will assume that we're using standard deviation divided by the square root of n every single time. And usually, the populations are very large and sample size very big. So correction factor is close to 1, and that's why we don't have to use it. Now, you can imagine if the n is very big and we subtract the n, and down here we have n minus 1, this will be close to 1 when the big n, the population size, is very big. Now, we're doing this to reduce the size of the standard deviation for the sampling distribution of x bar, which, by the way, is also called standard error. And we're dividing it by the square root of n. Anytime we take some number and divide it by some other number, it makes it smaller. Now let's look at some of the implications of this. So the relationship between sample size and the sampling distribution of x bar. Notice if our sample size was equal to 16, our standard deviation would be equal to 1. But if we upped the sample size to 64, that significantly brings down our standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar down to 0.15. And the implication is that there'll be more probability 
So the larger the sample size, this is n equals 64, notice that more of the probability is right in the middle, which means if we have a lower x and an upper x, the probability associated with that lower and upper x will be much larger. If the sample size is smaller, like if it was 16, the probability is more spread out. So if we had a, a given x lower and x upper, there would be less probability. And we will look at an example that proves exactly that. Now let's go over to Excel and look at our first example of the use of the central limit theorem. I'm going to click on the sheet example 1. Here's our question. An insurance company claims that the average cost per year of the policy is 824 bucks. So as soon as they have a claim like that, that becomes the default population mean. They issue 25,000 policies a year. The standard deviation for the population is known to be 195 bucks. And we want to find out the probability of getting a sample mean between plus or minus 25 and plus or minus 30. Not only that. But if we go out and take a random sample and get a sample mean of 857 at sample size equal to 300, is the original claim of 824 reasonable? Now, right off the bat, you know, we say, hey, this is a lot more. Ah, but we have to do our probability test. So let's go ahead and list our variables. Then we'll make our calculations, talk about this formula for standard deviation of the distribution of x bar. Hey, our mu, that's the original claim, 824. Our n, that's the population size. It's known here. It's finite. The insurance company has so many policies, 25,000. Sigma is known to be 195. And we're going to do something called the margin of error. And that's what it means when we say, what's the probability of getting a sample mean within plus or minus a certain amount? That means you take the mean, subtract that amount, and add that amount. Now, we've done that earlier where we calculated the margin of error when we added and subtracted a certain number of standard deviations. But here, they just gave it to us. I'm going to start off with 25. So our little n, that's the sample size of 300. And boom, n is really big here. We talked about our central limit theorem, right? Above 50 will help even a heavily skewed distribution look bell. But our n is really big, so even though the population distribution may be highly skewed, the standard deviation of x bar will be normal. Here's the mean, 824, right? And then we'll add some margin of error to either side. And that'll be all the probability in between. And then the probability on the outer edges will be considered the unreasonable zone. Everything in between here will be the reasonable zone. All right, now I want to check, because here's our formula. There's our standard error, our standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar. And that's our correction factor. So, so do we have to use this correction factor? Let's check it out. Equals, hey, the sample size divided by the population and enter. So no, this is less than 5%, so we don't have to do that correction factor. That means the standard error is simply, hey, population standard deviation divided by the square root of Rn. Now remember what we said, as the n gets big, then the probability associated with plus or minus some uh, mu is going to be much bigger. So our n is really big, $11.26. That will be our standard error, standard deviation for this distribution. Now we can go ahead and calculate x bar 1 and x bar 2. Hey, this is easy. They gave us the margin of error. So I'm going to subtract 25 bucks, 7.99. Now I'm going to add to the mean, the population mean, that 25 bucks. And so there's our two values. Now we can calculate the probability between these two values. Our n is big enough, so we can use our normal distribution and our norm.dist. So I'm going to use norm.dist. x, ah, so the screen tip here with the argument names aren't going to adjust when we start using x bars. We just have to know that that's the argument that accepts the x bar. So there's the big x bar comma, the mean, that's the population mean. Standard deviation, don't get tricked here. Don't click up here 
This is the distribution of all of our x bars, so we have to use the standard error. So care has to be taken when we switch over to x bar. The x is going to be x bar, and the standard deviation is going to be standard deviation for the distribution we're using, sampling distribution of x bar or standard error. Comma 1, because we're going from the small all the way up to some x. And we're trying to get between, right? So we're going to go all the way up to right there. And we're going to subtract, so norm.dis. Now we have to put our x, not our x, our small x bar, comma, the mean, comma, standard deviation. Remember, it's standard error, standard deviation for the distribution of x bar, comma, 1, close parentheses, and Enter. So 97 cents. No, it's not 97 cents. I'm either going to home and apply general or control shift grave accent tilde. So that's our probability. If we were looking at a picture, boom, there's 799. There's 849. So the probability between those two bookends, in essence, the mean plus our margin of error on either side, is huge. That probability means a 97% chance that we're going to get an x bar between one of these two values. And what was the original value we were given? 857. That's not in this range. That means that that's outside this range. So there's only about a 3% chance of going out and taking a random sample of 300 and finding a mean of that size. Now let's check this out. Let's go ahead and give them the benefit of the doubt and change the margin of error to 30, right? That means the interval, that means these two numbers will change, right? So now we're giving them 794 to 854, and that value is still not there. The probability associated with those two values, 99%. So it is just incredibly unlikely that we could go out and get a sample and get one this big. That leads us to conclude that maybe this original claim is not reasonable. Our conclusion, the probability of selecting 300 insurance policies and finding a sample mean between 794 and 854 is about 99%. If the population mean really is 824, then it seems unlikely that our sample of 857 would be possible. The original claim does not seem reasonable. Now, that's our first example. We'll see in a couple other great examples. But I want to go investigate this a little bit further. We're going to go over to the sheet SE Correction Factor. And here we want to take just our sigma from our last example and sample size and compare that sample size to different population size. We'll look at the sample size divided by population size. And then we'll do our test. We'll look at the correction factor, the standard error, and what happens to the standard error when we use the correction factor. So here equals, well, there's our n, 300. And I'm an F4 divided by, in this case, it looks like 300,000. So boom, that's very small. When I copy this down, each one of these, this is the one we did, right? We got 0 0.012, like 1. 0.2%. So only this last one, when there was a population size of 3,000, would this value be greater than 0.05. So if we did a formula, hey, are you greater than 0.05? That's a logical formula that comes out true and false. Control Enter and copy it down. So I can clearly see only this last one is when we have to use this. Now we're going to calculate the correction factor for each one of these here. So equals square root. And we have division to do in here with subtraction. So we're going to have to isolate the subtraction. Open parentheses. Hey, the big end, that's the population size, minus our sample size, F4. Close parentheses, and we're going to divide by open parentheses, population size minus 1. Close parentheses, close parentheses. That's our correction factor. And copy it down. And we can see that, sure enough, for the big values, it's exactly 1. And for very big values, it's almost 1. It's only when we get down to less than 5% that this gets to be a correction factor that will actually have an effect. Our standard error is simply our sigma, F4, divided by square root of our sample size, F4. This will be the same all the way down because we're not applying the correction factor yet. But if we apply the correction factor now equals, and I'm going to do it for all of them, OK? 
Control-Enter, and copy it down. Well, of course, the top one's times 1. And these are almost 1, so there's really not much difference. It's only when we get below 5% we have to use the correction factor, and we'll get a number that is different than our original standard error. Now we want to go over and look at another aspect of sigma divided by the square root of n. We want to go to n and probability. Here's our same example again. But what we want to do is we want to calculate our bookends. 84 plus or minus this 30 margin of error. And then for the standard error, change each one of the ends and watch how the probability for the bookends. The upper and lower will be exactly the same for each one of our ends. But as the end goes up, the probability will go up. So let's go ahead and calculate our standard error equals, hey, there's our sigma, f4, divided by square root. And this is a relative cell reference. We'll start with 50, Control Enter, and copy it down. So there's our standard error that we use for our first problem. There's the standard error for each one of those. Now the lower and upper is going to be the same. We just have mu f4 minus our margin of error f4. Control Enter and copy it down. It's the same for all of them in the upper. Hey, there's our mu f4 plus our margin of error f4. Control Enter and copy it down. So notice the probability for each one of these is the same two values, but there's going to be a different n. And watch this. Equals, and we'll use our norm.dis. We're trying to go between two. The bigger x bar, comma, mean f4, comma, the standard deviation. Oh, the standard error for the distribution of x bar. That's going to be a relative cell reference. Comma 1, close parentheses. Now, that's the probability all the way up to the upper, minus norm.dist, the lower x bar relative cell reference, comma, the mean, f4, comma, the standard error, relative cell reference, comma 1, close parentheses. Control Enter. 72 cents. I'm going to go apply General, drop down here, or Control Shift, Grave Accent, Tilde. So 72% all the way down to the one we had, which was 99%. And there's uh, still more 99 cents. If we change this back to 25, as we saw, then we have our upper and lower, same all the way down. But because as the n goes up, the probability for Finding an x bar between our upper and lower will go up. So if we looked at this on a plot, here it, is. here it is for n equals 100. You can see it's much flatter and more spread out. The standard error right here is 1950. For the n equals 300, you could see the probability is not as flat. It's more scrunched all up right in the middle. And that's associated with our n equals 300 and a standard error of $11.26. So the $7.99 and $8.49, those are the same two values. But you can clearly see there's lots more probability for our n equals 300 than there is for our n equals 100. Now we want to look at two more examples. I'm going to scroll over. Example two. A report claims that Washington mean gas price is $2.57 and 4 tenths. Assume the sigma to be 22 cents. And we wanted to find out the probability of getting a x bar with size 50 plus or minus 6 cents. What would that be? Well, the standard error, we have to calculate that first equals, well, there's our sigma, standard deviation, divided by square root of our n, close parentheses. So about 3 cents. I bet you if we increase the decimals up here, so there's a couple extra little pennies there, about, about 3 cents. Now, the x bar lower and upper, they gave us the 6 cents. So I'm simply going to say, hey, the mean gas price, that was the original claim, minus this margin of error on the lower end equals 
population mean plus the margin of error on the upper end. And now we can calculate the probability between those. We could see here's a picture, right? If you're drawing a picture with a chart or on a piece of paper, it helps. We're trying to calculate the probability between $2.51 and about $2.63, all that area there. Now we're going to come here and do equals norm dot dist. X, no, 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 X bar upper, comma, there's the mean, comma, standard deviation. Remember, it's got to be your standard error, comma, one, close parentheses, norm dot dist, smaller X bar, comma, mean, comma, standard error, comma, one, close parentheses. So the probability is not 94 cents, control, shift, grave, accent, or tilde about 90, almost 95%. So if we're looking here, if we went out and found a mean between 251 and 263, we had about 95% chance of finding there. So that might be our range. We might consider any mean we find in there to be reasonable. Anything outside that range would not be reasonable. So if this was the original claim, and we went out and find, found something between here, we go, OK, that seems reasonable. Some conclusions and different ways to Say this, the probability of selecting a sample of 50 gas stations and finding the sample mean within 6 cents of 257 is about 95%. A random sample of 50 gas station has a point about 95 probability of providing a sample mean that is within 0.06 of the population mean. We could also say, hey, there's a 0.05, about 5% probability that the sample will not be in our interval. Now we have one more example, all illustrating the central limit theorem. Now here's an example from manufacturing. History for a food manufacturer shows that the weight for chocolate-covered sugar bombs, a popular breakfast cereal, the box just says 14 ounces, right? Standard deviation for the population is known to be 0.4 ounces. If the morning shift sample shows X bar, that means they went out and at a particular point in time, they took a sample of an ongoing process, 14.14 .14 ounces, the sample size was 30. The question is, is this sampling error reasonable, mean, meaning the difference between these two is about 0.14 ounces? So if the, is that sampling error reasonable, or do we need to shut down the filling operations and fix it? So over here, I drew a picture, right, because we're interested on the upper end. We're going to let our function go all the way up to our 14.4 using our standard error, right, and then calculate the probability there. And the probability on the upper end will turn out to be that small amount there. All right, so the standard error equals we were given our population standard deviation divided by square root. Sample size 30, and Enter. So our standard error will be 0.073 ounces. The x upper, well, that's already given it to, to us. That is on this upper end here. Enter. Now, we could calculate our z and the probability for uh, using a z, but I'm going to go straight to our norm dot dist. Actually, we'll come back and do the z one in just a second. We have our x bar. That was the actual sample taken. That's going to give us the probability all the way from the lower end up to that point. Comma, the mean, that's what was given on the box. Standard deviation, it's the standard error, comma, 1, and close parentheses. So 0.97. Now, if we wanted to calculate the probability on the upper end, that's here. We use our complement rule, equals 1 minus, and boom, there it is, 0 0.0276. So the probability associated with x bar, 14.14 .14 ounces, is very small. That means the probability of getting 14.14 or greater ounces, very small. It is unlikely that we could have taken a sample of 14.14 .14 14 ounces and had the sampling error occur by chance. It is reasonable to assume that the machine is filling the boxes with too much cereal. Now we might want to do z just to know how many standard deviations. We haven't actually done this calculation yet. Hey, that's when we take our particular x bar right there and subtract our population mean and then divide by our standard error. 
and then control enter. That would be the z for this sampling distribution of our x bar. Now, if we were calculating with that z on the upper end, we would use norm.sdist. And I say, hey, give me that z right there, comma, cumulative, and it will tell me 0.97238. All right, now in this video, we talked a lot about this central limit theorem. We used it on a breakfast cereal example. We used it on a gas prices in Washington example. We talked about what happens to the standard error and to probability as our sample size changes. We talked about the correction factor and how most of the time it's not going to be needed. But when sample size divided by population size is greater than 0.05, then you have to use that correction factor. We talked about an insurance claim and looked investigated to see whether it was reasonable or not. And then we constructed a sample distribution of x bar. And we did a couple examples. One where we had 6,188 possible samples, but we came to the same conclusion. The sampling distribution of x bar tended to be a bell shaped distribution. The variation was less, and the population mean was exactly equal to our expected x bar value, or mu sub x bar. And we saw on the combination sheet, we even found some code online to calculate 6,000 different samples for us. And we started off with a smaller, simpler example that we've been using since the beginning of this chapter. And there we saw when we plotted the sampling distribution of x bar, it was bell shaped, the variation was less, and population mean was exactly equal to mu sub x bar, or our expected x bar. All right, next video, we'll talk about sampling distribution of p-bar, which is a proportion. All right, see you next video.